Good morning. Welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. It's good to see you all here today. Um, I don't want to jinx it, but I, I think we're actually kind of in spring. Um, now it'll snow tomorrow, so I apologize. Um, uh, just to let you know, um, I am a little bit under the weather. I, it is not COVID, I've already checked. Um, it could be a sinus infection, it could be something else, but I'm going to try and not breathe heavily around anyone just in case because I'm not enjoying whatever it is I had and I don't want anyone else to have to have it. Um, as Christians, we want to share God's love and grace, not our germs. So, um, I don't see any... Nah, I stick my foot in my mouth. I see one little one. Um, our son, one Sunday school teacher is not going to be here today. Um, are you able to to take a munchkin if we need to, or or not? No. Hand, yeah. Okay, we'll figure that out. Um, I feel like I had something else I was going to announce, but I don't remember what it is. So, does anyone else have any announcements? Before I forget, on Friday, the kids with their uh, play date made flowers for their for moms or grandmas or whomever. So we have extra flowers in the back of the church. They're little marigolds. So feel free as you leave to take a little plant with you, and you can go ahead and plant it in your yard. Do you remember how many we ended up with? Uh, we had 13. Oh. Say so it sounded like more, but... It sounded... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of boys, a lot of boys. But the plants survived, so. No broken plants, no dirt being thrown at each other, so, you know, it was a good day. That's right. Did you want to, okay, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, my name is Fonda Heike, and I'll be your liturgist today. I do have a couple of announcements. As you came into the sanctuary, you might have noticed a uh, easel. On um, that has a couple of announcements. One is that Peter Harris, who used to be a pastor at Stony Creek, is officially retiring this year. And so Stony Creek uh, has been invited to attend a reception on May 21st. Um, the dates and times are out there. Uh, the other announcement on the bulletin is um, another former pastor of ours, Ken Ray, lost his wife Diane this week. So anyone who knew Pastor Ray and Diane and are interested, her memorial will be Wednesday with visitation on Tuesday. So the other information's there. Um, we need to get back into the habit of signing our attendance pads. Uh, luckily, last week I was able to remember and fill in those that didn't sign. So, But Pastor wants to get a better idea of how many are attending each Sunday so we can plan our programs, I think. And then the other last announcement is we think that the Easter lilies have lived their life. So if you purchased one and did not take it with you, uh, feel free to take it today and then they will be retired to Easter lily cemetery or something. I don't know where they're going. I'm gonna try again. I said to Pastor, that if all of them that I have planted and tried to get up the next year were to bloom, it would look a lot different at my house. I just cannot get them up. So take your Easter lily with you. With that, we are now going to ask those that are comfortable to stand and join with us in the call to worship and then remain standing for the first praise song which is found in your smaller bulletin or smaller handout, and that's found on uh, number 33, it's on page nine. So, good morning. At the name of Jesus, 
every knee should bend, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory to God. Amen. six, it will have you raising your hands and lifting the Lord. Number six, we'll do this twice. this time, I invite you to join with me in the opening prayer. Holy God, God all, all lives are yours, yours and, and you do not, not seek the death of any sinner. <coughs> Renew our hearts, refresh our spirits, and help us walk in your holy way, that we may welcome the impartiality of your judgment and accept your all-embracing goodness through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our affirmation today is found in your red bulletin of uh, on page 885. This is what is termed a modern 
affirmation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and, and the, the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. death. We, believe we believe in the Holy Spirit, Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in the time of need. We believe that this faith shall manifest itself in the service of love is set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to demand that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Amen. With grateful hearts, let us offer our gifts trusting in God's goodness. Please rise and join in the doxology. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your love shown to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Accept the offering of our lives in union with Christ's offering for us and make us humble and obedient servants who will work for your good pleasure. Through Christ with the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. Do you want me to skip the kids now?
right. If you would all join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us as beloved children of God, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will continue with our, our next hymn, uh, which is 166, All Praise to Thee for Thou, O King Divine. We're going to do verses 1, 3, and 5. So just the odd verses today. seated. We will now take um, some moments for lifting up joys and concerns. I would like to again echo uh, the need for prayers um, for Pastor Ken Ray and his family um, at the passing of his wife Diane. Um, she's been battling leukemia for quite some time um, and had gone into remission, come out, and um, Unfortunately, uh, this time, it was time for her to go home to God. So um, please keep them in your prayers. Um, and also, please continue to keep the um, people of the Ukraine, as well as the people of Russia who stand against the actions of their governments, please keep them all in your prayers as well. Do we have any other joys or concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Um, if you haven't done it yet, don't text your mother. Call your mother. <laughs> and if you're lucky enough to have her here yet, call her. Listen to the voice. Um, my joy is that over the weekend, on Friday particularly, I went to see Shirley Ellicott. She is doing so well. Um, we had a good 45-minute visit surrounded by lots of people. <laughs> um, she's, she has her good times and she, her not so good times, but all in all, I think she's doing very, very well. And she sends her love. Thank you. I visited mom and mother-in-law yesterday.
I have sort of a joy that in our Tuesday morning Bible study, Prophets and Kings, we learned that the Babylonians didn't attack the Israelites for a war. They attacked them because the Israelites were believing more in Bill than in God, and God punished them by having them captured. I think that's something that I never realized. Uh, I know this is Mother's Day, but uh, it also happened to be my wife Janet, and my, this would have been our 57th wedding anniversary we would be celebrating today. And I'm very grateful. Do we have any others? All right, I got, I got two more for you. Um, one, I'd like to acknowledge all of the uh, the people in our lives who may not be our biological mothers, but who have been like mothers to us in, in various ways, whether those are our uh, aunts or teachers or other relatives or um, just whoever God has placed in our lives who have um, cared for us, encouraged us, nourished us in, in whatever way that makes them just as important as maybe our biological mother. Um, I'd also like to ask for prayers for uh, my family and my mostly my father's side of the family. Um, his cousin Ernie, who has been paralyzed, if I'm remembering right, since they were kids, um, after diving into um, a lake that was much shallower than he thought, uh, he passed away this weekend. Um, so please uh, keep his family and my family in your prayers there from Saginaw, um, where we still have some extended family. If you would um, turn to hymn number 177, um, He is Lord, we're going to use that as our call to prayer. join me in an attitude of prayer. Through God's steadfast compassion for us, God has filled us with concern for our world. Therefore, we pray for what we need, saying, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you have, display, or you have placed a desire for truth and righteousness in the hearts of all people. Uplift those who seek to live faithfully and lovingly by the promptings of your spirit, even those who do not know your name, Save them from despair and lead them to the fullness of salvation. For seekers of truth, God of compassion, hear our prayers. God, you call the children of Israel to make known your righteousness, and you call disciples of Jesus to take the good news of your salvation to all the nations. Help those who know your name to be faithful to their calling, to live according to your commandments and to testify to your abounding love. For all who believe in you, God of compassion, hear our prayer. God, you have formed your people into communities of prayer and service. Strengthen the leaders of your church. Give them humble and obedient hearts after the example of Christ, who humbled himself in obedience to you. For ministers of the gospel, God of compassion, hear our prayers. God, you have placed in human hearts a hunger to understand the structures and rhythms of creation. Grant wisdom to those who seek to comprehend the inner workings of the world. Save them from arrogance and enable them to work for the flourishing of humankind and all creation. For scientists, God of compassion, hear our prayers. God, you fill the world with forms that delight the ear and eye. 
Give artists and musicians a vision of your transcendent beauty and grant them skill to render their vision in tangible works that manifest the sublime glory of your creation. For all artists, God of compassion, hear our prayers. God, you establish the nations of the world to order human community. Kindle love for peace among the nations and their leaders. Save them from pride of wealth or power and enable them to serve the common good. For those who govern, God of compassion, hear our prayers. God, you have provided the earth as a garden and you command the human community to till the land that it may be fruitful. Bless those called to the work of agriculture. Give those who benefit from farming thankful hearts for this good work. Help farmers to respect our common resources and to resist careless exploitation of nature for temporary gain. For those who farm the land, God of compassion, hear our prayers. God, you hear the cry of all who are in distress. Heal those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. Comfort them in their need and help those who care for them. Teach us to bear the burdens of our sisters and brothers with humility. For, this, for the sick and those in distress, God of compassion, hear our prayers. All of these prayers, as well as those we hold quietly in our own hearts and minds, we offer today through Christ by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would please join aloud with me in our prayer for illumination. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, give us the words of life that we may understand your way and follow your truth in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Old Testament Psalms. We're going to listen to the Psalm of David, and we're going to listen to verses 1 through 9. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you to do not let me put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are the treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in truth and teach me, for you are my God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember you, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. At this time, if you will turn in your hymnals to page 168, at the name of Jesus, page 168.
Okay, our second reading for this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2, which you can find beginning on page 1162 in the Pew Bibles. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regarding others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who through, excuse me, <coughs> who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and persevere generation, or perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, but even if I am being pursued out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, and in the same way you also must be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I may be cheered by news of you. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. All of them are seeking their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But Timothy's worth you know, how like a son with a father he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I trust in the Lord that I will also come soon. Still, I think it is necessary to send to you, oh boy, Epirotus, my brother and co-worker and fellow soldier, your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for all of you and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. He was indeed so ill that he nearly died, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him but also on me, so that I would not have the one sorrow after another. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, in order that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. Welcome him then in the Lord with all joy and honor such people, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for those services that you could not give me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you'd please join me again in an attitude of prayer. Loving God, you humble yourself by sending your only son, Jesus, to become human and work alongside humanity in your ministry. You could have sent down an army of angels or unleashed a whirlwind of power to get people back in line with the covenant. But instead, you showed humility and grace and love through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Help us to grow in our own humility and work together alongside you, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit to bring the good news to everyone in the world. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together in this place, be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. 
Well, good morning again to everyone. This morning we are continuing uh, in our four-week series on the book of Philippians, which we began last Sunday. The book of Philippians, as we learned last week, is a compilation of letters that the Apostle Paul, along with uh, Timothy, wrote to the church in Philippi. Philippi was in Macedonia, which we today now know as Greece. And this epistle, epistle being again another name for um, usually a letter, um, but it is also almost universally, uh, sorry, I'm jumping around here. This epistle, epistle being another name for a poem or a literary work in the form of a letter or a series of letters typically, this epistle is one that is universally accepted for the most part as having actually been written by Paul. There are other epistles in Scripture whose authorship is still debated, but this is one of the letters that, that seems to definitely have been written by Paul along with, with Timothy. Now last week we focused on the first chapter and the word joy. And when we considered all that Paul was, was going through and dealing with while imprisoned, we still found Paul was so, so joyous and, and saw the opportunity of his imprisonment to share the gospel. I also encouraged all of us, myself included, to try and, and look for the things that we feel chained to and see those as opportunities to see God at work in and through us, especially for others' sake. And now we're moving into chapter 2, which we just heard aloud a few moments ago. Now the first few verses of chapter 2 carry much the, the same kind of message, encouragement, encouragement, and instruction that the previous chapter 1 had given. For example, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. And where it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Overall, the same line of thinking and general ideas as we found earlier. And that's not surprising, really. Um, we should kind of expect to find something like this if, if we're nothing more than a, a segue into the second chapter after chapter one. Now, something I find very interesting concerns verses six through 11, um, or depending on the translation, five through 10 or 11. But these verses, this, this set, they are said to contain a famous poem that describes the nature of Christ and his act of redemption. And I want to read those verses to you once again, this time using the translation um, of Bart um, Ehrman. Uh, he is an agnostic, atheist, American New Testament scholar who focuses on textual criticism of the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the origins and development of early Christianity. And before anybody panics, after you heard me say that he is an agnostic atheist, please know that he is also the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He received both his Master's of Divinity and his doctorate from Princeton Theological Seminary. So while he may identify as an agnostic atheist, his knowledge of scripture and of faith rivals almost any other in our modern times in terms of biblical scholars. So here is his translation. You feel, can feel free to compare it to the text in the Bibles and the pews with you if you'd like. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard being equal with God something to be grasped after, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, and coming in the likeness of humans. And being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ehrman offers the idea that, that this passage actually constitutes an early Christian poem that was composed by someone else prior to Paul's writing. Potentially as, as early as the mid to late uh, 30 AD range. And that it was actually used by Paul in his epistle to the church in Philippi. And this passage has often been called a, a hymn by many, but there are a lot of scholars who believe that that's really not an appropriate uh, designation for this scripture because it doesn't really seem to have any kind of rhythmic or uh, metrical structure um, in its original Greek. So it doesn't, doesn't really fit how we would classify something as a hymn. But part of what makes this poem so important or, or significant is that it strongly suggests that, that there were very early Christians who understood Jesus to be a pre-existent celestial being, one who, who chose to take on human form rather than being just a human who was later exalted to a divine status of being a god. Now, another important thing to note is that while the author of the poem did believe that Jesus existed in heaven before his, his physical incarnation on earth, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that the author believed Jesus to be equal to God the Father prior to Jesus' death and resurrection. And, and this is in debate due to how the Greek word harpagmon, or something like that, um, that is found in verse 6, is translated. If harpagmon is interpreted or rendered as something to be exploited, as it is in many Christian Bible translations, then the implication is that Christ was already equal to God prior to being incarnated as human, which would fit in with our beliefs. Um, and not just ours as United Methodists, but most mainline Christian denominations. There are who, uh, some, however, uh, including Ehrman, that argue that the correct translation of that word um, would actually be something to be grasped after, which would imply that Jesus was not equal to God before his resurrection. Now, outside of this passage of text, Harpagmon... Um, the words related there were almost always used to refer to something that a person does not yet possess but is trying to acquire. And here's where it gets maybe a little more clear because it's widely agreed on by the interpreters of, of Scripture that this poem about Christ depicts Jesus as equal to God after the resurrection. This is mostly because the last two stanzas quote the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 22 and 23, which says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, which is, in the original context, clearly referring to God the Father, not Jesus, because Jesus hadn't made it to the scene. Everybody got all that? Clear as mud, right? I also want to quickly outline for you chapter 2. Verses 1 through 11 cover living humbly as servants of God, that with verse 1 through 4 focusing on the motivation to live humbly, and verses 5 through 11 on the model of living humbly, both in Christ's emptying and exaltation. From there we move to uh, verses 12 through 18, focusing on living obediently as children of God, including the, the energizing of God and the effect on the saints. And then finally, we move into verses 19 through 30, 
that give examples of humble servants. First in Timothy, um, in verses 19 through 24, and then Aphrodotus in verses 25 through 30. So humbleness, having humility. You know, there are some that, that say that humility is the grease that keeps relationships going. And yet I'm not convinced that we either really know what that word means or maybe we're just a, too afraid to really embrace it. It's not about how, how smart you are or how much money you have or anything like that. Humility is about really knowing and accepting and owning and living into who you are. I did a funeral a while back for a gentleman who, unfortunately, I'd never gotten to meet. Um, and after speaking with his daughter and uh, her husband, I really wish I had. Um, this guy would have been a lot of fun to hang out with. And we were going over the bits to the funeral service and got to music and it asked them what kind of music they would like and so we kind of went through some standard ones you expect to hear to, at a funeral. And then they said for the last song they had one in particular that they wanted to use and they hoped I'd be okay with it. And as a pastor, when you hear someone say something like that, you start to get a little nervous maybe. Um, because as a pastor, people make assumptions about what, what I might be okay with, what I might be offended by, what I might not deem as appropriate. Um, and so I get very curious when I hear someone, you know, preface, if you'll be okay with this. And the song that they chose and we used, um, and I'm blanking on the... Uh, the artist now, but um, the song, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Um, which I had not heard since I was younger, um, but recognized at least parts of it. Um, and I got to say, watching everyone kind of just burst into laughter and, and joyous tears, knowing this gentleman, um, it was... It was a really nice moment in that service. Um, but he, he actually would sing the song. His daughter showed me a video of him um, maybe a week before he passed, sitting in his recliner singing uh, the song a cappella. Um, and while he would, would claim that the song was about him, um, he actually had a very, very good grounding um, in humility. But I wonder, when it comes to acknowledging and owning and living into who we really are, are we, are we able to acknowledge when we need help and then actually ask for it? How did we ever get any kind of proper estimation of who we are? Yes, we know that we serve the Most High, but where exactly does that fit in the hierarchy of what we believe about ourselves? Are we, are we good at being humble? Is humility something that we can count amongst our own spiritual gifts? Are we good at asking for help when we need it? I know that last one is something that I struggle with quite a bit. And when we do struggle with it, we are potentially, we're potentially hurting two groups of people. The first is, the first one is you. You are hurting yourself because you're not giving yourself the time you need to, to rest, to grow, for self-care, or a myriad of other important things. And that will, and it does, take a toll on you physically, mentally, and spiritually. But the second group is anyone who would have helped you if you had only asked. You end up denying them, whether intentionally or not, 
but you are denying them the opportunity to share their gifts from God to help carry the load alongside a fellow child of God. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to try and take some extra time this week to work on your humility. And it may not be easy. In fact, for, for some of you and, and myself, definitely, this is probably going to take some extra effort and can prove to be quite challenging. But I really want you to, to make this effort to be better about and in your humility. Let someone else in. Let someone else help you. It doesn't have to be something huge and glamorous and monumental by any means. But try your best to do it. Remember what I said back during Lent about how we are better together. So let your humility become a prime example of, of how to grow and cultivate relationships, the kind of relationships that matter, that are feeding everyone involved, the kinds of relationship that God looks down at and sees joy. The kind of relationships that, that Jesus witnesses and knows just that much more that the sacrifice he made was more than worth it. Amen. If you would rise as you are able for our closing hymn, uh, number 174, his name is Wonderful, and we're going to sing this through twice. Beloved children of God, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ. To God be the glory, the blessing of God be with you, the love of Jesus fill you, and the power of the Holy Spirit sustain you now and always. Go forth and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.